All right, the book of Job. This is going to bug me because it was working so well earlier. All right, um, the book of Job. So as you can see on the slide, let's go ahead and go back. We didn't go through the first slide yet. Thank you. Uh, we, we've gone through so far uh, the Pentateuch. Pentateuch, right? The Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Sorry about um, the size of the wording as well. Some of the slides, when we get to them, it will be difficult for you to uh, see from where you're, from where you're at. Uh, we went through the historical books last Wednesday, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, all the way to Esther. Uh, this evening, we get the poetic books, and that's going to be Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. These books are referred to as the poetic books or also uh, the books of wisdom, wisdom literature as well. And uh, again, they consist of Job through Song of Solomon. Uh, This evening, of course, as we've had the last few Wednesday nights, it's very factual, right? We're just going to start throwing out facts to you guys. So again, if you want to take notes or or just kind of try to keep up with me, um, I will try to share as much scripture as I can as well, though. Um, These books were written by various authors, uh, and they have been given for everyday living, right? Guidance to everyday living. So uh, where the previous books, you know, the first five were for the law, uh, where, uh, the, uh, where Genesis through Deuteronomy was for the law, Joshua through Esther was for the history of the children of Israel, uh, Job through Song of Solomon is encouragement on how to live, practical living, how to apply it to our lives, right? And we're going to go ahead and start with the book of Job. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Uh, The book of Job, I know you can't read it from there because there's just so much crammed in, especially on this slide here, but it's divided up uh, into three main sections. So the first section being chapters one through three uh, would be the controversy between Uh, God and Satan, right? And if you're familiar with the book of Job, you know how the story goes. Satan comes to God and wants to discuss uh, about Job. We see chapters 4 through 37 uh, as you get there. Pretty much the whole rest of the book, the majority of the book, is all about this dialogue between Job and his, I guess, friends, if you want to call them that, right? I have such a hard time calling them Job's friends. You know, if, if you're familiar with the book, you know why. But um, they go through these cycles, they're called, right? So you have Job and Eliphaz and, and Bildad and Zophar, and they're going through these, you know, back and forth debates. And they kind of go through these three main cycles where each one of them speaks, and Job kind of gives his two cents as well at the end of that, uh, as far as what they have to say. And then from 38 on to the end of the book, uh, you have the Lord that finally comes in and says, uh, excuse me, can I say something, you know, and he wants to just uh, chime in and let them know what's really going on and just kind of give them some truth uh, to what's going on in Job's life. So um, Job is considered one of the oldest books ever written in the Bible, okay? Not necessarily the, uh, the timeline of it, right, because obviously Genesis is the oldest, the creation and all that. But when it was written, um, it's considered to be the oldest written book. And uh, it was written, believed, between 2000 and 1800 BC. And that would have been between the time that God called Abraham out of his land to be Father Abraham of the Israelites and uh, up, up until the time that Joseph uh, was heading into Egypt before the children of Israel were in captivity, though, to Egypt. So the book of Job focuses on three main topics. It focuses on conflict, it focuses on debate, and it also focuses, at the end of the book, those last few chapters, on repentance. So those are the three main things that we see throughout this book. And let's go ahead and read a few of the verses in Job, chapter 1, verse 3. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. So it Again, it highlight that he was the greatest of all the people of the East, right? He was a great man. 
He had a great land or a great family. He had great possessions. And uh, he was, everybody knew Job, you know, he was that great of a guy, right? Just his blessings that God had given him. Job was described as a righteous man, a man that feared God and tried very hard to stay away from evil, so much so that he would even wake up in the morning early and he would go and sacrifice to the Lord for his sins. And he wouldn't just sacrifice for his own sins, but it also says that he would go and sacrifice for his family's sins, just in case, you know, just in case his kids, you know, kids are always up to something, right? So he wanted to go and sacrifice for them and, you know, Lord, bless them and forgive them. And, you know, Job was just that type of guy and that righteous of a man. Praise the Lord, right? So uh, Job, let's read verses 9 through 11. It says, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So as quickly as we learn about Job being a righteous man, we learn about Satan wanting to destroy Job, right? And, uh, and you may notice that Satan's desire there in the end of verse 11 is not just to kill Job. It's not just to destroy Job or to harm Job, but what is it to do? It is to cause Job to curse God to his face. It is to completely just uh, turn Job to a rebellious heart. Right? A lot of times when we think of what Satan wants to do is that destruction and the boils and, and the killing of the children and all that. But think about it. Job wants, or I'm sorry, Satan wants Job to uh, curse God to his face. This is what drives Satan. And if you know anything about Satan, you know why and where he came from and what he did there in heaven, right? So he wants to strip Job from everything that Job has. Uh, he wants to strip him of his family, of his sanity, really, and uh, of his health. Uh, after Job endures his cattle being stolen and killed, his servants being murdered, his children dying, and the boils across his whole body, uh, and even his wife's call to curse God and die, to just give up, um, Job continues on serving the Lord or here in the uh, in the debates with his, uh, with his friends here. And all these things that happened to Job caused that old Christian saying, right? Christians to refer to their bad days as my day of Job, right? Have you ever heard a Christian say that? Oh man, I just had a day of Job today. You know, sometimes it's an exaggeration though, right? I think like, man, they got my order wrong at the restaurant. Oh, it's just a day of Job today, you know? It really doesn't compare to what Job went through throughout this book, you know? And now the debate starts between, again, Job and his friends, if you want to call them that, throughout the rest of the book. Uh, chapter 2, if you want to turn there, verse 11, says this. It says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all his adversity, they had come upon him. Each one came from his own place. Eliphaz the Temite, Bildad the, the Shumite, and Zophar the, the Nathamite, uh, Naman, it's so easy to say it when you guys aren't standing in front of me. You know that? Namanthathite. Can we, can we say that? That'll work, right? For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him, right? So funny. You might want to put like LOL at the end of that, right? And comfort him. So for the rest of the book, again, we have these three cycles just going back and forth between Job and these three guys. And chapters 4 through 14, we see the first cycle of speeches, and uh, we have uh, Eliphaz uh, with his great ability to comfort, right? He wants to go and just comfort Job. He tells Job uh, from chapters 4 through 5, as he speaks to Job, his, he's basically telling Job his encouragement and comfort is this, that the innocent don't suffer, the wicked do. And he calls Job to repent, right? What a friend. This is Eliphaz's encouragement to Job. The wicked do not suffer, Job. 
uh, uh, but I'm sorry, the innocent do not suffer, but the wicked do. And he calls Job to repentance. Job responds uh, harshly or rashly with accusations against Eliphaz. And uh, he ends up relying on his self-righteousness. And he brings up how, how uh, righteous of a person he is. And really for the rest of the book, Job ends up taking on this type of rebuttal you know, to his friends there. Then we have Bildad. Bildad rebukes Job in chapters 8, uh, one through tw- verses 1 through 22, and he rebukes Job, and he says, uh, you know what, Job, your children's death, he's not much better than, than the last guy, but he says your children's death was due to their sin, and he calls Job to repent, and that God would fill him with rejoicing, right? So if you want to know how not to counsel somebody, uh, read the book of Job. You know, read the encouragement from Job's friends here, and it'll give you pretty much an idea of what to do. You know, do the opposite, basically, of what they have. So just imagine everything that Job is going through. Uh, You know, his cattle stolen and killed, his children uh, killed from, uh, from the house falling upon them, the boils upon his body, and his friends decide to come to him and tell him how bad of a person he must be to bring all of this on him. And that none of this would come uh, if you were just uh, a righteous person. Uh, then we have, we have old Zophar, right? Zophar says in chapters, uh, chapter 11, and this is, all just, this is all just the first cycle, okay? Uh, he says there that Job actually received less punishment uh, than what he deserved, right? That's kind of the basis of his, uh, in, his comfort to Job, you know what, Job? I guess count yourself lucky or blessed because really you should have got it a lot worse than that. I don't know what could have been worse, you know. Uh, his wife was pretty much the only family member left, and she was the one telling him to curse God and die. So, you know, I don't know much what benefit it would have been to take her, but um, this is Zophar's encouragement to Job, right? And, uh, and this just goes on and on for a very long time. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have ever struggled to read the book of Job. It's difficult to read the book of Job, right? Especially when you get past that first cycle, you know, past chapter uh, 11, 12, it's like, wait, are we starting all over again? You know, so we kind of just do that all the way up until verse 30 or chapter 38, right? And uh, chapter 38 uh, until chapter 42, until the end of the book, it's that light at the end of the tunnel and the Lord ends up chiming in and just speaking some truth there to Job and the friends, right? So every book in the Bible is beneficial, right? Every single book is beneficial, sometimes even when you don't see it. And Job is one of those books that is very difficult at times when you're reading through it to see how awesome it is, but it is definitely an awesome book. And uh, really what it does is it looks at the life of somebody that is just struggling with problems and issues, right? This is what it really looks at. Somebody that's just going through pain and suffering within their lives. And, and, and it is such an encouragement, you know, to get through the whole book. Don't stop halfway through because you'll just want to, you know, just end it all. Um, you got to get to the end because that's where the hope really comes. And, 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 it's, and it's such simple truth that is spoken throughout this book, because think about how many people even still nowadays that go through things, and, and they have those friends, they have those people in their lives that want to encourage them, uh, and maybe even the heart is in the right place, but they just don't have the correct words you know, to do so. And, and they just come up and they just say, uh, if I can just say maybe the dumbest thing, You know, and it's like that person is just, you know, already going through so much and it it just tears them down and tears them apart. And this is what Job is going through. So if you are going through something like this, if you're having that day of Job or that week of Job or that year of Job, and you're going through all this stuff and, you know, people come up and you're just like, man, where's the encouragement at? You know, read the book of Job and get to the end and you'll find it in the Lord. You'll find it with Jesus, right? So what is God's response? I'm going to save you guys all the, the, uh, and the, the just gnashing of the teeth, and ooh, the biting and all that. And we're going to skip over all those 38 chapters. We're going to jump straight to, to 38 and, uh, through 42. And we're going to look at the Lord's response to Job, right? So let's go ahead, if you want to flip forward with me, to Job chapter 38, verse 1. We're going to read uh, through verses 4. It says, Then the Lord... Answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this? 
who darkens counsel. So this is, remember, this is the Lord responding now to Job. By words without knowledge, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Now remember, Job's response to his friends, right? You kind of think, well, man, why is the Lord being so harsh with Job, you know? He's gone through so much already and the friends are just beating him up and everything. And yet the Lord now, even right here in the very beginning, the Lord answers him, out of a whirlwind? Who is this who, who darkens counsel? Wow, that's pretty harsh words from the Lord. By words without knowledge, he's speaking not to the friends, he's speaking to Job. Now prepare yourself like a man, Job. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding, Job. And in Job chapter 42, Job, uh, God calls Job to repent of what? Self-righteousness really is what it is. You know, Job started out on, on the right path as a righteous man. But it's kind of like that humble guy who says, uh, hey, I'm a humble person. Well, all your humility just went out the window, right? And this is kind of where Job came to because he was a righteous man, which was great, but he started to defend himself is what he did. He started to defend himself to all of his friends that were bringing all the accusations upon him. And instead of allowing the Lord to defend him, as the word says that God is our defender, Job starts to defend himself. And God never wants us to defend ourselves. God never wants us to sit back and say, well, you know, I do this, that, and the other thing correct. And everything I do over here is right, you know. Oh, really? Okay, who's this who darkens counsel, you know, without knowledge? And where were you at the beginning of the earth? That's what God would say to us. What does the word say? It says that even our righteous works are like filthy rags, you know. So for us to say how great we are, it, it really it's diminishing the greatness of God is what it's doing. You know, and, and in chapter 42, God again calls Job to repent. He gives Job's friends uh, some homework. Uh, he tells them to go and sacrifice to the Lord and all that, and they do. And, and, uh, and it's, it really is such a neat book. And um, if you look at the end of the book, God being such a great God, we have a, a slide up here. Before... Uh, Basically, uh, chapter 42 and to the end, uh, it says that God did what? He doubled what Job had, correct? He doubled the possession. So he blessed Job so much more so than what Job even had. So Job had seven sons and three daughters on the left. I don't know if you can read it or not, but on the right, he had seven sons and three beautiful daughters, right? So they weren't just daughters, they were beautiful daughters. I don't know about the sons. The sons, I guess, were just sons still. He had 7,000 sheep, and, he had, and now Job has 14,000 sheep, right? He had 3,000 camels, it said. Now he has 6,000 camels. Job had 500 yoke of oxen. Now he has 1,000 yoke of oxen. He had 500 donkeys, and now Job has uh, 1,000 donkeys. And that is pretty much the book of Job. All right, we can go ahead and turn to the book of Psalms now. And uh, I'm going to try to get through these things because, wow, we have a lot to go through still. So we have the book of Psalms, right? This is our slide for the book of Psalms. It ha the book of Psalms is really neat. It's split up into five books, okay? It is not one complete book. It is not a narrative, so it's not a story that you're just reading throughout the whole book, right? Like you are through the book of Job, or like you are through the book of Genesis and Exodus and all these other books. The book of Psalms is five complete separate books that are all brought together, um, that were compiled by different men even, uh, but as one book of praise to the Lord. So the first book, and you'll even notice as you read through, your, uh, through Psalms, you'll see there if you're in Psalms chapter one, it says what? At the very top, it says book one, right? So that is your book one of Psalms, as it was a separate book in the beginning. So you have Psalms 1 through 41 is book one. Uh, Psalms 42 through 47 is book two. 73 through 89 is book three. 90 through 106 is four. And then 107 through 150 is book five. And you had all your compilers there. You had David who set up one through 40, the first book. David and Korah for the second book. Uh, As Asaph for the third book. Uh, a non, uh, um, they're not positive exactly who it was for the fourth, and then David for, uh, again, for book five. So 
This is uh, the book of Psalms. Psalms is the largest book in the Bible. Uh, it speaks of a lot of jubilation or celebration. It speaks of war. It speaks of peace even. It speaks of worship. It speaks of judgment. It speaks of messianic prophecy about Christ. It speaks of, uh, again, praise. And it also speaks of sorrow or lament. So a lot going on in the book of Psalms. And of course, again, these books are all poetic books, right? These are all books of worship. These are all books of praise or wisdom. So when you think of the book of Psalms, you think of poetry is, is what you should be thinking of, right? Uh, again, it's a collective work from many different authors. Uh, almost every Psalms contains some type of praise to the Lord. Uh, there's five books in all. It was written between 1400 BC and 430 BC, right? So they were written over a period of about a thousand years. And if you know anything about history, you know that the Roman Empire was established roughly about 500 BC, okay? So these went in, even the writings went into almost the, uh, uh, the beginning of the Roman Empire. Uh, you have 73 Psalms that were attributed to David, 12 uh, to, uh, uh, to Asaph, you have uh, the priests there. You have 10 to Korah, the sons of Korah, 50 to Solomon. You have uh, 150 psalms in all that were written, uh, that, that was written poetry with different parallelisms. So they're all, each one again is individual in and of itself. You know, it's one separate writing. So if you want to read it, read it that way as one separate writing, that one full psalm. Uh, you have Psalm 119 that is an example of a acrostic poem. Uh, and for Psalm 119, for every eight verses in a given stanza, it begins with the same letter, right? So really neat there in the Hebrew. Um, we have uh, an example of an acrostic poem here on the next slide. And this is as simple as, or as complicated as I can get, right? So you have apple pie, please let's eat, right? because Thanksgiving's coming up and I like pie. So you have apple pie, and what does it spell? It spells apple, right? So you have, and you guys, hopefully, you know, you get the point, right? So that's an acrostic, and that's how uh, the book of, of Psalms is kind of written just in that, in, in that theme, right? God is likened to many different things throughout the book of Psalms. He's, uh, he's likened to a shield. He's called our shield, which is really neat. He's called our rock, right? Our rock that we stand on. He's called our king, our shepherd, our judge, our refuge, our fortress. He's called our avenger. He's called our, our creator, our deliverer, our healer, our protector, our provider, and our redeemer. So many different things that God has referred to there in the book of Psalms. Really, he is whatever you need him to be, right? He is Jehovah. He, is, uh, he will meet us where we need him to meet us and pretty much be anything that we need him to be. Many of the Psalms point to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ again. They just prophesy about Christ, which is one of our foundations as believers. It should be one of the reasons why you are a Christian, right? There's reasons why you're a Christian, you know? Uh, uh, there's, if somebody asks you, how can you believe that stuff? Well, the historical side of it, because the history has proven itself throughout the Bible and the Old Testament, uh, because uh, personal uh, testimony because he's shown himself and made himself real in my life. And one reason should be the prophecy that, that the Bible speaks about. You know how amazing it is that every prophecy has come true. So you have some prophecy here. Psalms uh, 2 7 says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. And that is fulfilled in Matthew 3, 17. It says, and, a, and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? Psalm 2, uh, 22, 18 says, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. And Matthew 27, 35, it was fulfilled. It says, then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And, go, and it goes um, so on and so forth throughout the book of Psalms. Really neat because these men had no idea that they were even writing about Christ. You know, they, had, they thought they were just writing some sweet poems. You know? And yet in reality they were talking about uh, the Savior of the world. So, and I got to 
ton of other ones here, but uh, because of lack of time, we're not going to go through them all. We have uh, some of the most popular Psalms, Psalms 1, Psalm 23, and Psalm 119, right? Those are some favorites. Uh, Psalm 1, I, I was going to read it to you guys, but again, lack of time here. So it just says, it, I'll read the first verse. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, right? Again, one of the greatest Psalms. Also, Psalm 23, uh, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters, and he restores my soul. He leads me from the path of righteousness, and for his name's sake, right? Uh, uh, they all speak of desire and attraction and grace and protection and commitment that we have to the Lord. And then we have Psalm 119, 176 verses. I'm not going to read it. Uh, we would be here for an hour or so. Um, but it just speaks about the Word of God. It is one of my favorite Psalms. If you have time to study it, read it, go through it, pick it apart, and just listen to it over and over and over again because it is just talking about how powerful. God's word is. Psalm 119.9 says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Psalm 119.11, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119.105, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Beautiful psalms um, that tell us how important God's word is. Are, is something lacking in your life? Are you lacking the power of the Spirit? Are you lacking uh, the joy of the Lord? Are you lacking, you know, just joy altogether? Are you lacking something within your relationships, within your family? Um, whatever it is you are lacking, it is found in the Word of God, and that is what Psalms 119 is telling you. This brings us to the book of Proverbs. You guys can turn to the book of Proverbs. If we look at our slide again, you see highlighted the three different topics that the book of Proverbs speaks about. The first topic there, I'll read it to you because you can't see it. It says, uh, the person of wisdom, uh, the person of wisdom, and then the principles of wisdom, and then the practice of wisdom. And, and uh, this is what the book of Proverbs is kind of broken into, right? So Proverbs, you know, is written by uh, the man who wrote the next three books. He wrote the book of Proverbs. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and he also wrote the book of uh, the Song of Solomon. And uh, this is King Solomon. Um, King Solomon, and you'll see on the next slide that famous story of Solomon as the women brought the baby to him, and they asked, uh, you know, as they were fighting over it, and Solomon said what? He said, well, let's do this. Let's cut the baby in half, divide it between both of you, and then we'll all be happy, Right? And of course, uh, the baby's real mom uh, screamed out, no, don't do that. I'd rather see the baby live. And uh, this is just a taste of Solomon's wisdom that God uh, gave to Solomon, right? It's been said that Solomon was the wisest man to ever live and also the most foolish. And if you know his writings, you know why. Uh, Solomon was the second son of King David and Bathsheba after the first uh, baby died. And in chapters uh, Three of First King, God appeared to King Solomon in a dream and asked Solomon, what shall I give you? And King Solomon asked the Lord. He basically spoke to God and said, uh, said uh, told the Lord that, Lord, uh, I've seen so much with my father David, you know, the troubles and just everything that he has gone through as king. And, and he said, I'm a young man and I don't even, you know, know how to rule pretty much. So what I need is I need understanding God. And just a neat thing that Solomon asked for from the Lord. So the Lord gave Solomon that wisdom and that understanding. And, uh, and Solomon definitely had understanding. He had the capacity to do what was right. When you look at Solomon, he wasn't an ignorant person. He didn't sin ignorantly, you know. Um, he didn't sin without knowledge and without knowing better. He, um, for Solomon, many times he chose to do wrong. He willfully sinned knowingly, you know, because he had that wisdom, right? You guys know anyone like that, right? Our hands should be the first one, right? At first, you started thinking of somebody else, and it was like, oh, then I heard the laughter, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, you know, us, right? So many times we willfully sin, and uh, what a shame, though, when you see somebody with so much, so many gifts, so much potential from the Lord, and yet willfully, you know, sinning, willfully deciding 
not to follow the Lord. You know, I, I know somebody like that personally who, for me, it's like this guy is just one of the smartest guys I know. And uh, he has that photo, photographic, photogenic, photographic, right? Thank you. Photographic memory and uh, everything. And it's like he, he, his mind blows me away. And, and yet, unfortunately, it's his knowledge that actually keeps him from the Lord because he thinks he's smarter than the word of God. And it's just, it blows me away, but how great of a Christian this man would be, you know, just giving it over to the Lord. Um, one neat thing that Solomon did right was write the book of Proverbs, right? And Proverbs is basically, it's just full of short statements expressing truth, things to live by. Uh, many people wrote Proverbs, right? Many different people throughout the world wrote little Proverbs, little you know, snippets of truth. Benjamin Franklin wrote a lot of Proverbs, and I'll read a couple of them for you. One says, diligence overcomes difficulties. Sloth makes them, right? He said, if a man could have half his wishes, he would double his troubles. He said, if you would keep your secret from an enemy, tell it not to a friend. And for us Christians, he said, how many observe Christ's birthday how few his precepts. Oh, tis easier to keep holidays than commandments, right? So uh, interesting proverbs from Benjamin Franklin. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, uh, he, speaking of Solomon, spoke, it says that he spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs that he wrote numbered 1,005. The difference, the really neat difference between the world's proverbs and Solomon's Proverbs is the spirit of the Lord, right? Is that Solomon's Proverbs were inspired by God. They were written by God for us. And though these Proverbs that we read from other people like Benjamin Franklin, though they're neat and though they're true, they lack the power that uh, you receive and that you get when you read the Bible, when you read Proverbs. You know, you just read them and it's like, wow. They blow you away like how true that is, how much it still applies to my life. And really it's because of the spirit of the Lord. Solomon said in one seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Some popular Proverbs, three, five, and six. You guys know that one, right? It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path, right? Speaking of what? Our relationship to God. Speaking of our relationship to God. Proverbs 2, 20, uh, 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Speaking of our relationship with our children, right? Training up a child. Proverbs twenty two seventeen says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Speaking of our relationship with one another. And Proverbs thirty one thirty says, charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Speaking of a relationship of a woman with her makeup. No, I'm just kidding. Of, uh, of our relationship with our God again. And it's really neat because all of the Proverbs, these Proverbs of Solomon are all speaking of relationships. And yet you look at a lot of the, the Proverbs from other people like Benjamin Franklin, and they're all speaking of what? Success. Rise early in the morning, you know, the early bird gets the worm and all that. And yet you see the Proverbs that the Lord decided to write were mainly focused on relationships. And it just tells me how important relationships are to the Lord. How important it is for us to build strong relationships, to be able to encourage others. And that quote that I always love and I always say, uh, is they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Because it's not, it's not until we build a strong relationship with somebody that we can encourage them and then we can share with them and that they can actually receive because before that, it's just who are you and, you know, and what are you talking about? And it, we just come out of nowhere with it. That brings us to the book of Ecclesiastes. Moving on, Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is a book written to those that trust in this world rather than 
trust in God. And for me personally, this is a, 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 a very personal book to me. It's a book that God has used in my life uh, because it is a book that just grounds you in the Lord. It tells you to flee from this world. This world has nothing for you and flee to the Lord because God has everything that you'll ever need. And for me personally, when I was in my early 20s, it was a very difficult time. And, and it was a time where the Lord just said, Roman, wake up. This world has nothing for you. And it was through the book of Ecclesiastes that he had me read one morning, the whole book, because I was going through a lot of stuff and just reading through it in tears is, man, Lord, this, you know, I do not want this world. I do not want to be like this man Solomon and what he went through. Uh, we see our slide here. Again, it's broken up into different sections here, the divisions. Chapter one, all is vanity. Chapter two, vanity of doing. Chapter 3 through 6, vanity of having. Chapter 7 through 9, vanity of being. Chapters 10 through 11, uh, using life well. And chapter 12, the source of the living. Ecclesiastes. It's believed that at this point, Solomon as king has really left the safety of the Lord, right? Um, it was at that point, it's believed that he started to take on hundreds of foreign wives and allowed the idolatry to just uh, pull him away from God. And if you read through Ecclesiastes, it totally makes sense for that. It was written almost a thousand years before Christ. Uh, Am I talking really fast? I apologize. I'm talking really fast because we have two more books to go through and I don't want to keep you guys here till nine. So um, you get questions at the end, right? So Uh, A thousand years before Christ, it's a reflection of Solomon's thoughts on life, success, and eternity. Um, Where Proverbs was warning, uh, God's warning to Solomon and his guideline for successful, uh, a successful Christian life, Ecclesiastes, is that aftermath of a life that is separated from God. And King Solomon goes through a list of things that he tried in seeking um, that fulfillment from this world. He tries uh, the career achievements, materialism, alcohol pleasure, and even the wisdom of the world. And all these things he found uh, that all is vanity, all is meaningless, is his conclusion. And you know, I would agree with Solomon that all is vanity and all is meaningless, but I would add at the end of that statement, at the end of every single, almost everything that you read from Solomon here, um, all is vanity, all is meaningless without the Lord. As you read Ecclesiastes, as you go through it, keep that phrase in your mind, without the Lord. That will allow you to understand the book of Ecclesiastes. I've heard people teach on Ecclesiastes. I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't think so. And it's just a, a very hard, difficult book to understand. Because a lot of times when we read the Bible, we take it for face value and we, we read something and we think that that is truth, what we're reading, when really we have to take it in context to what it is actually saying. Like when the word says that there is no God, well, no, a fool in his heart says there is no God. When you take it in context. So yes, all is vanity, but all is vanity without the Lord, Solomon. All is meaningless when you don't have the Lord, when you're not following Christ, right? So Ecclesiastes 1, 2, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity without the Lord, right? Without the Lord. Uh, 1, 3, what profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? No profit, I would say, without the Lord. 1, 9, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun without the Lord. How do we know this? Because Lamentations 3, 22 and through 23 tells me, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. To me, mercies are new every morning. So are there new things under the sun? God's mercies are new every morning. Is everything vanity and all that junk? Yeah, absolutely, when you don't have the Lord. When, you, when you're not looking at things in light of eternity, you know? Verse, one, uh, verse uh, 18 of chapter 1 says, for in, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow without the Lord. Solomon was without the Lord as he wrote Ecclesiastes. Um, but yet having the wisdom and understanding from the Lord, he ended it. Uh, with one of the most awesome verses in the Bible, I think, verse 13 of chapter 12. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole manner. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. 
Amen. This is man's all. Everything is meaningless without God. Riches, relationship, family is vanity. It's empty without God. You know, but I love my home. I love my wife. I love my son. And believe it or not, I even love my job. I can stand up here before you and tell you I love my job. The one I get paid for, not this one. Why? Because I have the Lord. Because my joy comes from the Lord. Not because they're so great. They are great. But not because of that. It's because of the Lord. Fear God and keep his commandments, Solomon says. Brings us to Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. There's a lot here. If you want to read it afterwards, let me know. Song of Solomon is a love song filled with metaphors and imagery. And uh, it's one of the 1,005 songs that Solomon wrote. There's three main speakers in the book of Song of Solomon. There's the bride, the Shulamite. There's the king, Solomon. And there's the chorus, the daughters of Jerusalem. And some believe that this book was written before Solomon started multiplying wives and taking on the idolatry and all that. Why? Because the way he pursued the Shulamite and just the innocence of his writing. So again, uh, a lot, sometimes you ask, well, how do they know when those books were written and, and you know, where the prophecy comes in and just where to date these things? A lot of times when you know uh, a man's life or the history behind it, you can try to figure out where to place these things. So they believe it was before Solomon really left the Lord. The book is divided into four main divisions, falling in love, united in love, struggling in love and growing in love. And if you're a married couple, and I stress the word married, um, have and you're, you're having some difficulties in your marriage, I would encourage you to have some fun and read this book together. Uh, and it's just, uh, again, just an awesome love song uh, between a husband and a wife. And really, uh, yes, it's a, a beautiful book when you read it and you see it for what it is as far as uh, a man pursuing a woman and a woman pursuing a man but it's even more beautiful when you read it in, in the spiritual side and really the Lord pursuing Israel or even the Lord pursuing the church, right? And that is us, that is you, uh, the church. So how beautiful it is to see Christ and the Lord desire us the way Solomon desires the bride here. And this dialogue between the Shulamite uh, the, and the beloved just keeps going back and forth, back and forth. It kind of reminds me of every uh, um, every you know love movie or every love story that I never wanted to watch with my wife, right? Uh, those movies, those chick flicks, you know that that you're just like, oh my gosh, just get to the end of it already, you know? It's like, no, you hang up, no, you hang up, no, you hang up. Okay, I'm gonna hang up, you know? And then it's like, are you still there? Yeah, I'm, I didn't hang up, you know? It's just that whole thing going back and forth, back and forth. And uh, I encourage you to read it again. It's it's really neat, but it just it's just that sappy old love story, right? But if you don't like, if you don't love sappy old love stories, learn to love them. Learn to love them. Because this is God's love for you. God's love for you is that sappy old love story. God's love for you is that compassion and just that, even, even that corniness, you know, that's in there. This is God's love for you. Learn to love it. Sometimes we, we uh, you know, especially as men, I think women, it's maybe easier for you. Uh, some, some not though, um, but especially for men, you know, that we're just so rough and we don't want to um, show that sensitive side of us, you know, and shed a tear, you know, or tell someone even that we love them, you know. But you know what, man? I, uh, when I hold my son and I kiss him, it's one of my favorite times during the day. And I pray to the Lord when I hold him. Uh, literally, I pray, Lord, let him grow up and let him never uh, not like kissing his father. Uh, because I want to kiss him uh, even when he's an old man. And that's the love that I have for him. And that's the love that I believe that my God has for me. Speaking of my son, there he is. And, uh, but listen to the importance of God's love. Listen to the important the importance, let me say that again, of love, of love in our lives. What's the book of love or the chapter of love? 1 Corinthians 13, right? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging 
symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith and that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I have nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Learn to love. Learn to love. Drop your pride. Because God loves you deeply. And he desires us not to be the most eloquent, not to be the most educated. He doesn't desire us to speak with the, word, with the tongues of men and of angels, but he desires us to love. He doesn't desire us to be successful and have our jobs and provide for our family. He desires us to come home and to tell our wives how much we love them and to hug them and to kiss them. That is what God puts the importance on. Some of the popular verses in Song of Solomon's is 2-4. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me is love. Speaks of protection. 2-4 says, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. It speaks of self-control. And one of my favorite, 2-4, it says, I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. And it speaks of how corny a man can be. <laughs> my filly among the chariots. I don't know why I like that verse, but I just do. Some of the Bible is completely misunderstood without the Holy Spirit. And this is definitely one of the books that can be misunderstood. But uh, you know what? Love makes a man do crazy things, right? Doesn't love make a man do crazy things? Think about when you were dating your spouse and how nuts you were, you know? It's like you would drive an hour and a half to go see them wherever they were. And now they ask you to go get a, a gallon of milk from the store and you're like, oh, honey, but it's late. It's 10 minutes down the road, honey, you know? And love makes you do crazy things. When I proposed to my wife five years ago, I did it through a poem. And going through and reading all these po this poetry and you know, all, all these love songs, it just reminded me of that, that poem that I wrote to my wife. And you know, no, you'll never read it. It's between me and her. In fact, um, Gabby, next slide. That's a photo of me and her on our way to our honeymoon. Okay, you can go to the next one. You don't need to leave that up. But it makes you do crazy things, right? But you know how much thought I put into that poem? How much of my heart I put into it? You know, and you know how easy it came to me? Believe it or not, it came pretty easy. And I was the one that was shocked the most. You know, I would love to have told her, man, it took me a month. And I, just, I you know, it was just, I wrote, and I crumbled it up and I threw it away. Honestly, it took me like eight minutes. You <laughs> know? It was quick. But you know, I just sat down and I prayed and I just started writing. And there it came. And this is God's love for us. John 15, 12 and 13, it says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friend. There is no greater love than Christ's love for you. He laid down his life for you. He died on the cross for you. And though we read through these poetic books and the books of wisdom, the, the literature here, and we think, uh, you know, what does this have to do with my Christian life? It has everything to do with your life. It has everything to do with your walk with the Lord because it is one of the most important commandments God has given you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. What else is there? Christ said all the laws and everything hang on this one commandment. Is it not one of the most important sections of the Bible now that we think about it? 
really is. Get rid of the pride. Get rid of everything, you guys. Fall in love with the Lord. Fall in love with one another. Fall in love with one another. It's the hardest thing to do, but it's one of the most important. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your love. Your love is so great, Lord. It is so amazing that you would die on the cross for us, that you would take those lashes and the beating, that you would come down from heaven and take the form of a man. You would put on flesh, Lord, so that you could feel the beating, so that you could walk among us, God, so that you could teach us and you could love us and you could laugh with us. You could hang out with us, God, and you could love us, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you wrote this love song to us, God, that you didn't just come down and say, okay, here's the formula here and just follow this and you'll be okay and do X, Y, and Z. But Lord, you put passion into it. You put tears and sweat and blood into it, Lord. It was real to you, Father. And you desire, Lord, our walks with you to be the same. Get us out of tradition, Father. Get us out of religion, Lord. And get us, Lord God, into that relationship with you, Father. If we are struggling, Lord, with love, I pray right now, God, that you would break down the walls. That you would allow us, Lord, to love our spouses, to love our friends, to love our family, Lord, our parents and our children. God, that we would forget all the hurt, all the times that we've been offended, Lord, all the things that they've done wrong. Because, Lord, when you hung on the cross, I'm sure you didn't think of any of those things. You thought of how much you just love us and how much you want to be with us. You promised, Lord, that you would never partake of communion until we're there with you. Father, let us love like you love, Lord passionately and joyfully, Lord. Not to say, well, this is love because I'm providing for you. No. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not boast. It's long-suffering. Lord, let us love the way you love, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this evening, God. And I pray, Father, that as we go... uh, just about this week, Lord, that we would remember, Father, the things that you spoke to us this evening, Father. We thank you, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen.